Welcome back, Breakaway Wealth. I'm your host, Jim Oliver, and with me today is Stephen Libman. Stephen, welcome, buddy. Hey, thanks, um, so Jim. Stephen, thanks for having me on, man. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I'm excited. I love talking to people that have made a transition from real estate agent to real estate business owner. Now, I say real estate business owner because real estate investing is a business, right? And we and we have to think of everything we do in our lives like a business, even our family, we have to run it like a business. But tell us a little bit about you, what you're doing now, kind of uh, tell us a little bit of your story. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I am the managing partner or one of two managing partners of Integrity Holdings Group. We've been in business for just about 11 years now. Prior to that, I was a real estate agent and then a broker. Um, I'm a Christian business owner and we um, purchase and acquire and keep and operate hundreds of millions of dollars of commercial real estate assets now. So we, we started in the real estate agency space and then broker and then started a wholesale business because we didn't have two nickels to rub together. Um, and that is kind of the lowest barrier to entry as far as I could tell for real estate investing. I wanted to be an investor. So we started wholesaling contracts, which was just putting a contract under contract and then putting the deposit down and then selling that contract or the rights to that contract to another end user. And then, uh, so we did that for about the next seven years. We flipped about a thousand houses, um, built a pretty good machine and built us a very highly taxed, highly transactional job in the process. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's not what all of us thought about, I think, when we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Cashflow Quadrant or any of those types of books that make you think a little bit differently. They think, hey, we need to do X so that I can work less so I'd spend more time with my family and create that passive income. Wholesaling and flipping is anything but passive, um, you know, until you scale out of it, right? And what I realized seven years in is that I hustled up the wrong mountain and we built kind of in my purview, the wrong business. Um, the tax benefits that come along with commercial real estate investing are significant. The passivity of it, um, it allows for third party management. So over the last three or four years, we've bought, sold uh, over $150 million worth of property. We own over a thousand uh, multifamily units. And last year we just sold uh, 400,000 square feet of self-storage facilities that we built ground up that was managed by CubeSmart. So that's the long and the short of it. The, uh, yeah. the, heart, the heart behind the business is uh, we run a donor advised fund and that donor advised fund uh, funds many ministries around the world and has helped a lot of people. And this business is unique in its capability to create consistent cash flow to the nonprofit world. If that's something that's a part of, uh, of what you want your business model to be, you know, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to get to a place where we're giving away 80% of our income through the business, through the donor advised fund. You know, it's uh, interesting that you say that because, um, you know, uh, some friends and I, mine and, and myself, we've been talking about that too. Some, uh, you know, creating some businesses where 90% goes to the kingdom, 10% goes to the owners and, you know, kind of flipping the script a little bit. So uh, yeah, um, with you hundred percent, a hundred percent there, Stephen, where are you located? So I just moved after 39 years of living at the Jersey Shore to uh, South Carolina. Nice. So nice. When, well, I heard uh, uh, Winana, kind of my my implementer, my person that keeps me going in the right direction. She was just down in South Carolina last week and she said it was pretty cold. Yeah, I got a little bit of a cold snap. I mean, we're down by the Georgia border down by like Hilton Head, but cold oh, nice. here and cold. I went to school in, in Boston so yeah. cold here and cold in Boston is like two different worlds. Uh, I agree. I lived in South Dakota and, um, it, you know, part of the time and also Southwest Florida. And I can yeah. tell you that, Stephen, um, after a while being there in South Carolina, you will be ruined. Uh, your friends in Boston will laugh at you when you tell them that it's, you know, 70 <laughs> and a little windy and it's kind of cold, you know, uh, I know. They, they will make fun of you. I know. Uh, I'm prepared. Mean, I'm prepared for it. <laughs> so, okay. So what did you do? I mean, like, you know, one of the things that we talk about is breaking away. So, you know, a lot of times people get into real estate and they, but you know, you have, you probably had a job before that, you know, tell me about your journey of breaking away and kind of having that faith and that trust just to say, Hey, 
let let's let's go in the direction. And I think part of it, what what I want to hear, because I I know this for myself, is I know that if I'm doing the right thing and serving others, that I'm gonna my business is gonna grow bigger than I can ever imagine. So I kind of get that same feeling from what you guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't a light switch, right? We didn't start there. We we certainly had the entrepreneurial spirit, at least I did through college. Um, but I did go get some W-2 jobs, some sales jobs in New York City. And then um, and then even being a real estate agent, that's a job, you know, I mean, so we were looking for properties and, and things like that for other clients. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us either read a book or heard a story or met, met a mentor that kind of opens your eyes to the next level. I wasn't uh, born and raised in wealth. I wasn't born and raised with a mindset of investment other than, you know, 401ks and you know, you mentioned before, we're kind of anti-stock market. And that's because of the volatility of it for me. I mean, I've run a podcast called Free From Wall Street just to let people know that like, that's not the only way. And I think for so long, we're all taught that that is the only way. And um, yeah, so, you know, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, read Tax-Free Wealth, read some some different um, educational books and decided, hey, I I think I'm kind of unemployable. I'm not the easiest employee because I always have different ideas and um, that makes it difficult to be a duck, right? You want to be an eagle. And um, so the impetus of the business was my business partner and I actually wrote a business plan about a wholesale business, about a flip business. And he, um, and there was a death that was very close to us and they were, they were young. They were in their uh, late twenties and we just closed our first wholesale deal and we made $16,000 check and we split it 8,000 each. And he went to Costa Rica for a month to surf. And uh, I was married at the time, he was not. He calls me up and he says, hey, why don't you guys come down here before we had kids? And we did, we went to Costa Rica for 10 days and we sat on the beach and decided that life was too short um, to not try. And we came home, we burnt the boats and without literally a thousand dollars in the in in the bank account we decided to start this business and quit our w-2 jobs which is not for everybody i'm not saying that that's maybe the best idea for everybody but for us it was and uh and then you know fast forward 11 years later and we are uh changing our mindsets about what leadership looks like and what giving and serving looks like and i think that it's a entrepreneurial journey that a lot of people go through i think you only grow uh, your business will only grow to the level of the lid that you are at as a leader. And what that means is probably giving up a lot of the things that you don't want to give up. It's empowering people that maybe you're not ready to empower yet. And it's just literally learning how to serve them in a better capacity so that they can grow and run the business to the next uh, next heights. You know, absolutely. Um, I've been following and reading and consuming Dan Sullivan um, strategic coach stuff for since 1990 and I think he started in like 1985 or something like that so it wasn't too long after he started but he works with entrepreneurs all over the world and a lot of the things that you're saying you're exactly right you know you have your unique ability everybody has a unique ability that something that you do better than anybody else and the more that we can spend our time in that unique ability the the happier we're going to be right and not only the more productive, but the happier we're going to be. And it's when we are forced to do things outside of our unique ability that we're not happy. So, you know, there, a lot of times people are listening to the show or they're reading a book and they could be, you know, um, they have a, they're, they're trading time for money somewhere and they want to break away from that, but they... They, they, they need a transition plan. They need something more passive um, or maybe they, they need it to be 100% passive. Like they don't want to, it's kind of who, not how, right? They want to find a who that can help them get into real estate, not learn how to get into real estate. So how yeah. do you help somebody like, like that, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, so all of our investors are passive investors. You know, we, we allow them to be as active or as passive as they want in terms of understanding the business. So, you know, we're the operators, right? We're going out and finding the deal. We're going out and operating the deal. We're, we're doing the CapEx. We're doing, you know, the renovations, the, the unit turns, the third party manager managing them. Um, so our investors range from, I mean, my, you know, my eight-year-old is our 
smallest investor in terms of <laughs> nice. both age and dollar amount. Um, but she's invested in into our fund and that gets deployed and it makes passive income. And, and, you know, so our investors can be all, all different types of people. I have, you know, full-time retirees that are now full-time investors that just put their money to work and put it on the field. And that cash flow allows them to exist without depleting their legacy, right? The, the cash flows are over and above what the nut is. And they, they can now preserve that legacy um, number. And I think a lot of us were taught maybe to put everything into your 401k. And then when you start drawing down on it, that's how you retire, you know, that paradigm has shifted for me where it's like, no, you don't touch your principal, you live off the cash flows, and then your principal gets passed on to your kids. And that's kind of the legacy. Um, so all of our investors are either, you know, retirees, I have full time anesthesiologists that, you know, they, they're, they're making a good income, right? So they, they recognize that that active income, as long as it's turned into passive income over time, is beneficial to their life and lifestyle and retirement. So, you know, and then we send out monthly reports, you know, with pictures and videos and all kinds of fun stuff that they can look through 170 page asset management reports, which they can or cannot go through. So again, they could be as active or, or as passive as they want, but we want to put people in the position to at least make it uh, a passive income for themselves if they so choose. No, I love, you know, I love that. I love what you said about the 401k because, you know, when I, I got started in the wealth management financial planner world um, coming out of college and and did that for uh, 15 years. And um, I, 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 I would tell you that Nelson Nash opened my eyes to when, a, when the government controls your money, you're in trouble, right? And in a 401k, the government controls your money and Wall Street controls your money. You got two entities fighting against you that say they're on your side, but they're going to get paid no matter what. And, and pretty powerful and organizations. Yeah. The, and they know how to get money to flow to them instead of away from them. Right. And, and so, you know, the, the 401k plan is, is what we would call a financial slave plan because mm -hmm. you put money in there for 20, 30, 40 years you take it out. And now that people think that they're going to distribute the money at like seven or 8%, which is not true. It's like three to 4% using the Monte Carlo method. If you want to make sure you're not, if you want to have a good chance of not running out of money in 25 years, right? So you take it for every million dollars you have, you're getting 35 to $40,000 of taxable income. I mean, I, I, I would promise you there are a lot of better ways to do it than that. And you're being taxed at, at you know, 100%, no, no deductions, no depreciation, nothing, right? right. And not, not cap gains. Yeah. 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 And, and so, you know, I think that what, what I'm really encouraged by is younger people. And I don't know if you are seeing this, Stephen, obviously your daughter at eight is getting it, right? But um, younger people are getting this. They are not looking to put money in Wall Street for 20, 30, 40 years and then hope they don't run out of money someday. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we are seeing it. I mean, we have a lot of younger investors. I just turned 40. So like our, our demographic tends to be the people that we have been around for the last 10 years. So that 30 to 40 year old space is starting to recognize that, you know, the, the market volatility is, it's costly over time, right? I mean, when you lose, when you have $100,000 and you take a 20% loss, you don't need to make 20% to get back to even, you need to make 25% to get back to even. And that over time, that cost of that volatility costs you a significant um, amount of retirement. And, you know, secondarily, I, I read in Money Magazine, you know, the inventor of the 401k called it, I forget the quote, maybe you'll know it, but it, he said it was like a monster that was out of control. It, the 401k has become something that they didn't intend for it to become. And you yeah, know, it wasn't designed to be this. Yeah. And deferring into a future uh unknown tax bracket to me is yeah. just bananas I, I keep having this conversation with people and i say you know historically speaking do you think taxes go up or down and like, yeah do you think government is going to be making better or worse decisions over time yeah. and you know it's it's pretty overwhelming that the evidence states that the numbers aren't going to work unless they hike taxes well if i'm going to hike taxes and i'm taking you know, my money and putting it out 30 years before I take it in to get taxed, 
is it likely that I'm going to be paying higher or lower taxes? And I, for me, I'd rather pay the tax now and let stuff grow and distribute tax free. You know, we, I'm an IBC um, proponent as well. My, you know, we have our own policies. My kids have policies. And I think it just gives you a dual benefit where you can create some income on one hand, while also if you under overfund the policy while having a death benefit that can help your family. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we show people how to invest in real estate. One of the, uh, or we show people that they want to buy assets, right? So you want to buy assets that keep up with inflation, that you can raise your rents or raise your prices in businesses to keep up. And the value of those assets go up when inflation goes up because inflation is a tax, right? It's a stealth tax. You don't see it coming. You don't have representation, but it just happens and it happens at whatever rate they want it to, right? And, and so- to be taxed in the future, like you would never invest in real estate if you didn't understand the tax consequences, right? Right. But you'll, but people will put their money in a 401k for 20, 30, 40 years and not know how much they're going to get taxed. I know. It's and, But it's a slave mentality. I mean, you know, um, I think it's really interesting that in the New Testament, it talks about money over 2000 times, right? And I thought, you know, because our money, money gives you choices, choices give you freedom. And I believe that that's the Bible is about abundance and freedom, right? And, and, um, and so, but if our human life is measured in time, right, then we are trading our time for money, we're trading our lives for money, right? But then when there's monetary debasement, meaning the money that we're having our pocket is becoming worth less and less and less every day. That means that somebody's stealing from us. Well, if they're stealing our money, then they're stealing our time. They're stealing our life. Stealing somebody's life is the very definition of slavery. Okay. So, so I think that's why it's mentioned so many times is because it's, we, you know, God doesn't want you to be a slave. God wants you to be free, right? right. You have to understand the old Testament was the problem. The New Testament is the solution, and the solution is not slavery, right? So right. it's telling you, hey, put your money in motion because motion is the law of God. If our money doesn't move, if you're not buying properties and moving money, then that money's dying. Money sitting in Wall Street is dying. And so, um, all right, Stephen, so somebody sitting out there, they want to know. Okay, they want to know more about you. Obviously, they could listen to your podcast free free from Wall Street. Is that what it's called? Yeah. And uh, and we have some buddies that do wealth without Wall Street. So, but I like free from Wall Street. Awesome, and, Joey. Uh, we love those guys. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We know those guys. We've known them for too long. No, I'm just kidding. For a long time. <laughs> but uh, 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 Russ and Joey do a great job, and they're and they're and they're proponents of the same types of things. Is freeing people and getting people away from wall street. But, um, so they could go to their, what, what about your website? I looked at your website, remind people what your website is. Yeah. So you can go to integrityhg.com hotel golf. Uh, the name of the company is integrity holdings group. You can find us on all kinds of social media platforms. I think if you're going to go to our website, you can, uh, you can sign up for our investor club, which will allow us to get on the phone and talk to you about your investment goals and see if there's a fit. Um, also check out the invest with purpose tab. It's my favorite tab on our website. It talks about all of the ministries and nonprofits around the world that we are able to fund through our donor advised fund. And they'll give you some cool updates and some links to, to those nonprofits as well to see um, just how beneficial investment can be to people that make money go really far. Yeah, you know what I what I really like to do, Stephen, is introduce the audience to people that, you know, if they went to 10 websites, one of them is going to speak to them, right? One of them, they're going to go, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Or maybe it's three of them, you know, whatever that number is. But I think that, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a good idea to try to educate yourself and, and, and to see, is this a right fit for me? And like you said, the what, what you're doing for uh, uh, charity and trying to help people. I mean, if you're gonna make money and help people at the same time, in my belief system, that is rewarded and will grow and will become more abundant. And um, so that's that's really cool that you guys are doing that. And if 
what's one piece of advice that you'd give somebody that maybe just hasn't, you know, I, mean, I, I probably already know what it's going to be, but um, that just hasn't decided to pull the trigger on getting into real estate. What, what would, be, what would be the first action that you would do? Yeah. I mean, action taking is kind of the, the crux of doing this. Right. So I, but I would say, you know, I think there's usually a fear factor that's associated with it. Right. They think that they may, may might need to learn more about it. Um, at least that's what, typically in the past has held me back is not knowing or not feeling like I had enough information. Um, so it's really important to find people that you know, like, and trust that can have a conversation with you to kind of clear some of those fears and design and, you know, out of your way, because, you know, it's like the four minute mile, right? Once you saw it, once they saw somebody do the four minute mile, there was other guys right behind them that were breaking the four minute mile. And it's just because you know, it's possible, right? I mean, we've been doing this for 11 years we partner with guys, you know, that are operating for 40, 45 years. And, you know, you, you can do a SWOT assessment, right? A strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats in your own mind on your own investment and say, okay, what are my strengths? Well, here's my strengths. I have some liquid capital. What's my weakness? I don't know everything about how to operate a deal. What's a threat? Inexperience is a threat to your money. So, uh, or not, not, not knowing, right? In Wall Street, for me, I think it's always interesting that people throw money in mutual funds with a hundred companies. They don't know a single one inside of them, why they would invest in them. Um, you know, so if you find people that you know, like and trust that are doing it, have been through the gate before you that can explain some of the things and, and explain in earnest what the downside risks are, right? And, and be able to tell you how you can allay those risks by underwriting, by partnerships, by things like that. Then I think you'll get more comfortable. And if you get more comfortable and then you still don't pull the trigger, stop wasting everybody's time, right? Just decide not to do it, but decide one way or the other, right? Because if you think or you know that real estate over time is the best wealth building concept in the world and you agree that your active income should be put into passive income like that, then there's something else missing, right? If you get all the information that you need and you still can't make a decision, then there's something else. You need to figure out what that something else is. But I think partnerships can can easily get you out of the fear factor and into the active participation of it. You know, I, I like what you just said there, Stephen, because what we say is, um, you know, you need a guide, but you know, but you wouldn't go up Mount Everest with a guide you didn't trust. So I would just show up on day one and say a base camp and say, okay, you're my guy. Great. Now I, you know, I would have been, okay, tell me about yourself. How many times have you done it? Uh, yeah. you know, tell me this. How many people have you lost? Ever... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how many, yeah, how many, how many people have fro you know, have frozen to death on the way down, you know, uh, and how did you make it? You know, like I would have questions, right? But then Absolutely. after a while, if I had the best Sherpa on the mountain. Then I go, you know what? I, I got my best chance with this guy, right? Yep. And, you know, stuff happens, you know, the uh, stuff happens on a, on a mountain like Everest. And, you know, our lives are like a mountain like that is uh, it's challenging. It's there's times where it's cold. There's times where you think, hey, I'm not going to make it. And there's times when you're standing on the on the on the peak of the mountain and and you're on top of the world. So. Um, you, you can't get there without the climb. Right. And, and so if you're going to climb, you need a guide, you need some help if you're smart or you probably won't make it. So, uh, Agreed. I love that. I love your approach. I'm definitely going to check out your website and check out some of the, your club, your investor club and, and some of, uh, and your, in your podcast. Um, all right, Steven, if God came down, uh, from heaven, and said you could only retain the knowledge from one book that you've read, what would it be? Well, it's kind of interesting because the question is the answer in that one, right? It's, it's got to be the Bible, which... Well, now I normally say other than the Bible. Other okay, than the Bible? Other oh, than man. the Bible, yeah. All I right, so now... Part, so na yeah, I've been thinking about this for a while. I was like, it's so easy. Well, yeah. um, so one book, all the knowledge in one book, you know, I think um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman is probably one of the books that makes you think differently about why you make different decisions and how you can kind of make better decisions by just having this knowledge. So Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman is a, is a Nobel uh, Peace Prize winning economist. So yeah. he's not 
he's not a real estate guy and he's not, you know, Kiyosaki and he's not Tom Wheelwright, but I think thinking fast and slow is one of those thick uh, cerebral books that, that can make you think in a different way and give you some pause as to why you're making decisions that you're making. And I would say a close second and just cause I'm reading it now and I'm absolutely enamored with it is um, the road less stupid. Yeah. The road less yeah. stupid is um, it's just a very practical guide on how to make better decisions. So, you know, and I, and I, you know, I like what you're taught the, the path that you're talking about is how we make decisions, by the way, thinking fast and slow, um, help me understand my wife a lot better and understand how she thinks differently mm. than how I think. And, um, so I, I, right, smile cause you're an entrepreneur. Said, so you're, you're very fast paced, I, I presume. Right. And she needs to yeah. process like my wife does because yeah. opposites tend to attract. And yeah. that, that was very helpful. And even saying like, Hey, honey, I need you to answer faster and her saying, I need time to process. And then we would yeah. kind of split the difference, right? And say, okay, well, how much time do you need? How much time do yeah. I need? And then it would come, instead of an argument, it would just be a conversation, which is healthy in marriage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my wife likes to ask a lot of questions. So I'm like, no, 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 I've already passed those questions, but I needed to come back and go, all right, let me answer all your questions. Just like I would, mm -hmm. you know, a customer or something like that, or a business partner. So uh, once I kind of learned that, um uh then it, it helped me a lot so so i'm uh i like that you brought that book up and uh um uh, so all right well thank you so much for coming on i've got a lot of things in my head based on what you said and i'm intrigued and want to learn more about what you guys are doing and uh uh because i love the charity aspect of it definitely love that and i believe that always gets rewarded so uh give them just all your information one more time, podcast, what uh, email. Yeah, so uh, Stephen Libman, integrityhg.com uh, website. And our podcast is free from Wall Street. And you can reach us at Stephen at integrityhg.com. Um, but yeah, we're all over the place. And we love nothing more than to actually, we just hired uh, a new director of strategic relationships and, and investor success. He's got 25 years with fidelity in the senior wealth management space. Now, why would a guy like that want to yeah. leave and come to a shop like ours? Well, reach out to us and you'll find out more about his story and why he sees the benefit long-term for his previous clients, as well as our future clients. It's a, uh, it's a good. Awesome. Thing. Awesome. Well, Steven, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing everything that you shared today. Thank you for your time.